Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today at uh, Learn and Share. Today, we're going to have a talk by Roberto Paricella on constant size ZK snarks in ROM from falsifiable assumptions. So thanks a lot, Roberto, for uh, coming here and giving this talk. I'm um, okay. quite happy to think about it. Uh, we had a few talks on uh, uh, KZG uh, soundness, and so I, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thanks. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, can you hear me right? Yeah. OK. So this is a joint work with uh, uh, Helger Lipma and uh, Jan Nassim, uh, and the paper has uh, accepted to the next Eurocrypt. And this is, I think, the first presentation of this paper. Uh, so let's uh, jump into it. Um, the talk will be divided into uh, four uh, different chapters, let's say. I will start with uh, some preliminaries and also explaining the main motivations for our work and why should we care. Uh, then I will present uh, uh, the main result of this uh, paper, which is a new um, security proof for the uh, KDG extractability. Uh, of course, I will, I will define uh, the KDG commitment scheme in the talk and also explain what is uh, its extractability property. Then I will uh, briefly present uh, uh, what we built on top of our first result. So second result, uh, how we actually construct the constant size NARC in the random oracle model promised in the title. And lastly, I will briefly mention some uh, uh, open questions. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them, actually, we have found uh, some solution which will uh, uh, come um, in the form of a follow-up work. OK, so let's jump into the first uh, section. Um, when we think about this uh, uh, circuit satisfiability problem, uh, that are actually the problem underlying uh, most of uh, um, today's NARC application, we can think of having a public arithmetic circuit as the one uh, here in the slide. And then we have a public statement uh, uh, X and uh, uh, a witness W for X, which is usually private. Uh, and the W is a witness for X. If uh, uh, we plug W into the circuit, we evaluated it and we get back uh, X, so the public state. Uh, there is a, um, a flourish branch of cryptography which study uh, equivalence between uh, this kind of problems and the other problems that comes in the form of constraint systems. So uh, many different constraint system exist. Um, here, I just want to give you some intuition of what is uh, a constraint system and uh, um, uh, why I would like to do so, because like, then we can understand what is the problem underlying uh, uh, SNARKs that are deployed by industries and use it. And the constraint system is none other than a set of public equations, such as Maybe uh, we can think about them as polynomial equations of a certain forms. Uh, then we have this public statement X and the witness W, and W is a witness for X. If uh, we plug uh, X and W in this constraint system, and we get that all the equations are uh, satisfied. So usually it's an equivalent form of writing uh, uh, arithmetic circuits. For instance, each gate of the circuits define uh, an equation in the constraint system. Uh, then, uh, moving on, what is a zero-knowledge argument? Um, it's a protocol basically engaged by uh, two parties, uh, Alice the prover and Bob the verifier. And I define it directly into the SRS model using a uh, uh, constraint system as um, uh, an language example or an application example for this zero knowledge argument. So um, the SRS stands for uh, structured reference string. Uh, and uh, it means that we suppose the existence of a trusted third party that computes this SRS and uh, makes the, it available to both prover and verifier as an input. Uh, then those two parties also have the public statement X, the prover has 
the private witness W. And uh, um, they start to interact and exchange messages according to what the protocol prescribed. And at the end, the verifier output uh, accept or reject. And it should output accept if and only if it is convinced that the prover knows the witness. But the point is that um, the interaction should not reveal any information, uh, any additional information about the witness beside the fact that the prover should indeed know it. If on top of that, uh, we require uh, no interaction from the verifier, so we require that the prover compute the proof in one message and send it to the verifier, then we have an ESIX, so a non-interactive zero-knowledge argument. Formally, um, zero-knowledge has to enjoy uh, three security properties. So completeness means that honest prover will always convince the verifier, which means that if W is a witness for the public constraint system, under the statement text, uh, then the verifier accept. Knowledge soundness uh, <coughs> means that if the verifier accept, then the prover must indeed know a valid witness. What does it mean? Uh, well, we can image a sort of malicious prover with uh, having some auxiliary information deviate to what the protocol prescribed and try to make the verifier accept. By knowledge soundness, we want to be sure that the witness can be computed by this auxiliary information. And this is formalized by requiring the existence of a Turing machine called extractor, which can interact with this uh, malicious prover and eventually extract a W, such that given the fact that the verifier accept, uh, W will be a valid witness. And lastly, we have zero knowledge, uh, which uh, is the security property against a malicious verifier. So now it's Bob that is trying to act maliciously and learn something about the witness deviating from what the protocol prescribed. By the zero knowledge, we have that uh, uh, no matter what is Bob's strategy, he will fail in learn uh, um, information about the witness. On top of these three security properties, we also require uh, some efficiency property. And particularly in this um, work, we care about uh, strong succinctness uh, um, guarantees, um, requiring that um, the proof sides, so um, the sides of the exchange uh, of the total exchange in messages, as well as uh, the complexity of the verification algorithm, they should be uh, constant in the witness sides, so independent from the witness sides, and uh, hopefully uh, of a small constant. And this is the case for uh, uh, protocol deployed by industries in real applications. If on top of these four requirements, we add uh, that we need uh, uh, non-interactiveness, then we have a snark. So SNARK stands for uh, uh, Succinct Non-Interactive Argument of Knowledge, and it's a protocol that satisfies those uh, four conditions. In our case, we, there are also non uh, constant size SNARKs, but uh, we do not care about them today. And we actually focus about uh, knowledge soundness under the uh, efficiency requirement that we have introduced here because completeness and zero knowledge will actually be trivial for the construction uh, uh, presented uh, here. So um, I will just focus on proving the knowledge soundness of our SNARKs, which will achieve this uh, succinctness uh, requirement. Um, there exists uh, a popular framework uh, that has been successful in design uh, those kind of snarks, which is, for instance, the one used in Planck, Lunar, and Marlin. And this framework uh, consists in taking two primitives. The first one is an information theoretic proof model, such as uh, IOPs, interactive oracle proofs, but others can be used. The second one is to use an extractable polynomial commitment scheme, such as the KZG commitment scheme that uh, uh, we care about today. Um, and we use the KZG because it, it achieves um, constant sides, um, proof, and verification complexity. And then we take these two primitives and we compile them into a succinct interactive zero-knowledge argument. 
Um, now we can compile this interactive argument again using the famous Fiat Shamir transform to remove the need for interactiveness and uh, we end up with a snark. So um, if this framework is uh, uh, so successful, uh, what is the problem? Because we actually end up with a very good snark in this framework. Um, the problem is the security proof. In order to show that the KDG commitment scheme is extractable, uh, we need to rely on an uh, uh, ideal model uh, to model cryptographic groups, uh, such as, for instance, the AGM, the algebraic group model, or the GGM. On top of that, in order to show the security of the Fiat Shamir transform, uh, we rely on a, a second different ideal model. So uh, the random oracle model, uh, which means that um, the um, result snark has security that is based on uh, two different ideal models, which is already uh, like not an ideal security proof, not a desirable security proof. But uh, we also have another issue. Um, I will show uh, soon uh, that the way those ideal cryptographic groups here are used to prove extractability of KDG in uh, construction such as Planck and Lunar is actually um, questionable in itself. Um, particularly, um, it results in a proof that do not translate um, in the standard model directly. So we really need uh, a better security proof for this kind of construction. And uh, since our construction will also use uh, the Fiat Shamir transform and the random oracle model as this uh, last step, during this talk, I will uh, only present uh, this uh, intermediate step. So uh, I will only um, achieve this uh, succinct interactive zero knowledge argument, and then one can apply the Fiat Shamir transform and obtain the snark. Okay, is there any questions so far? Uh, no, we're good, thanks. Okay, then I will move on and define uh, polynomial commitment schemes. So polynomial commitment scheme is uh, a tuple of four algorithms. We have a key generation algorithm, which takes as input some public parameter and an integer n, and output a, a commitment key. We can think of this n as a bound of uh, uh, the degree of the polynomial that we can commit uh, with uh, this commitment key. Then we have a commitment algorithm, which takes a public key and a polynomial f of degree up to n, and output a commitment. Uh, the third algorithm is the opening algorithm, which takes this uh, commitment key, then the couple of uh, commitment and uh, secret committed polynomial f, and also an evaluation point alpha, and output uh, eta and phi, where eta is supposed to be the evaluation of the polynomial f at the evaluation point alpha, and phi is a proof that the evaluation has been performed correctly. So uh, please just try to remind this uh, notation because I will uh, use it in the paper extensively. Alpha here, uh, they will be evaluation points. Eta, uh, they will be evaluations of the polynomial. So this should be f of alpha in the honest case. And pi uh, is the proof uh, to prove that eta is equal to f of alpha. Uh, which means that the fourth algorithm is a verification algorithm that takes uh, the commitment key, the commitment, evaluation point, and uh, uh, evaluation and proof, and output uh, uh, zero for reject, one for accept. And the point is that this verification should accept uh, if it is convinced that eta is equal to f of alpha uh, for the polynomial f of x that is committed in C and f of x should be of degree up to n. So let's try to formalize this uh, uh, security guarantees. We have a, a usual completeness property, which 
means that if everyone is honest, then the verifier accept. We have the hiding property, which I will only define at very high level, uh, which means that public information, so commitment, evaluation point, evaluation and proof, does not reveal any information about the polynomial f, beside the fact that uh, uh, f of alpha is equal to eta. And then we have this evaluation binding, which says that, uh, which model the informal fact that the commitment is bound to only one polynomial. Uh, and it's defined by the fact that uh, if some, like the image, someone that can try to um, open the commitment, the same commitment at the same evaluation point, at two different evaluation, eta different from eta prime, uh, then uh, this should be art. So no uh, efficient Turing machine should be able to, to output uh, these two different valid evaluations. Uh, and we do not care about hiding because uh, like hiding is used for zero knowledge. And I said already that uh, here we only focus about knowledge soundness. Uh, but those three properties, uh, um, the the key the G commitment scheme has uh, all of them under a standard uh, and good security proof. What is the problem? That uh, when we want to use a polynomial commitment scheme for a SNARK, we need um, a stronger uh, security guarantees. Uh, we need uh, that if the verifier accept, uh, then the prover must know the committed polynomial. And this property is called uh, black box extraction. And uh, it's again uh, formalized by requiring the existence of an extractor. Uh, Imagine the extractor playing in the following game. So we have an adversary. The adversary see the commitment key uh, and output a commitment and some auxiliary information. Then someone, let's say the extractor, output uh, this um, uh, random evaluation point. And then um, the prover, um, like, sorry, uh, then uh, this information, like the um, commitment and the auxiliary information and the evaluation point, are used to run a deterministic prover, uh, which output um, um, openings and proof. If this deterministic prover makes the verifier accept, uh, then um, we have this extractor that can interact with the deterministic prover and eventually output a committed polynomial. So this is the um, definition of black box extraction for a commitment scheme. Uh, then I will introduce some notation for uh, cryptographic groups. It's the bracket notation. So uh, we have additive abelian group, uh, the generator is this uh, one in bracket, the element of order x is x in bracket, and the group operation is the addition, which means that this scalar multiplication is the exponentiation. Those groups are cryptographic, meaning that there is some uh, hardness. Uh, for instance, the discrete logarithm holds, so given x in bracket, it's hard to recover the discrete logarithm x. Uh, but also multiplication should be hard. This is the CDH assumption. And uh, find the element uh, of order inverse should be hard. This is called, known as SDH assumption. But uh, many different hardness assumptions are defined for uh, cryptographic groups. And um, here I just want to give you uh, some intuition of the reasonable hardness that we can assume in this group, uh, particularly the one that we need to understand our um, the construction we use and our security proof. So let's say that we have an adversary that receives as input uh, uh, group elements of order sigma to the various powers. And this adversary should output a group element of order f of sigma. Um, we would like to know for which kind of function this is an easy task and for which kind of function this uh, can be assumed to be an art task. Well, for instance, if f is a polynomial of degree up to n, then it's easy to see that this is an easy task because uh, the element of order f sigma can be computed using a, um, 
scalar multiplication and addition, so or lacet operations. On the other hand, if f is a polynomial of degree more than m, uh, then this should be an R task because intuitively this is morally equivalent to compute uh, the element of order uh, sigma m, uh, which can be considered as a special case of the multiplication, which is hard. And the same holds if f is a rational function, a proper rational function. So the first uh, task should be hard uh, as a variation of a CDH assumption, and the second task should be hard as a variation of an SDH assumption. And uh, lastly, uh, actually groups used uh, in um, uh, today's application in the state of arts, they have some additional structure. So we suppose the existence of three groups, G1, G2, and G target of the same order, uh, P, with P is a big prime. Uh, group elements are indicated with the uh, paddocks on the brackets for their respective groups. And then we have this uh, bullet here, which is a pairing operator defined as here in the slide. So take the element of order X in group one, pair with the element of order Y in group two, and we get the element of order X times Y in target group. So this is basically a way to perform one and only one uh, multiplication and to check the result in a third group. And lastly, uh, we require that it is hard uh, to compute isomorphisms between the two groups. So this is the structure that we have for uh, uh, state-of-art pairing-based cryptography. If there are no questions, I will move on and present, finally, the KZNG polynomial commitment scheme. So I have to uh, give you the four algorithms. The key generation algorithm, uh, sample a random uh, integer, and then uh, output the commitment key, which is on the form of uh, group element in group one of power of order sigma to the various power up to the chosen n, and uh, the generator and the element of order sigma in group two. Uh, then the commitment algorithm um, just uh, compute the group element in group one of order f sigma, where f is the committed polynomial and uh, uh, sigma is the trapdoor in the CRS. Of course, since f is a polynomial of degree up to n and um, the commitment key contains all element of order up to sigma n in group one, then this is an easy task and we can compute the commitment. The open algorithm is a little bit more complicated, more elaborated. Uh, first, we compute the evaluation honestly. So eta is equal to f of alpha, as it should be. Uh, then we define this rational function, h of x, defined here as in the slide. So remember that in the honest case, this eta is equal to f of alpha. And the proof is the group element of order h sigma. Uh, where uh, h is this rational function. Uh, lastly, the verification equation just uh, check that everything has been computed correctly. So uh, the numerator here of h of x computed in sigma, which is available uh, to the verifier, should be equal to this uh, h of x computed uh, at sigma, which is the order of this pi. Uh, times the denominator at sigma. Okay, uh, now what is the point of why this uh, commitment scheme works and it is secure? Um, it relies on the fact that h of x, which is in general a rational function, is actually a polynomial function if and only if eta is equal to uh, f of alpha. So, um, remember the variation of the STH assumption that I've talked before. Um, if uh, the prover was honest, then uh, h of x is defined as a polynomial function and the prover can compute it. Otherwise, if the prover tries to compute a valid proof for um, any other uh, point eta, uh, then this is equivalent to compute uh, a proper rational function, and this should be R. And from this, we can show the evaluation binding property, uh, 
And this is done in the original paper where they presented the scheme under a nice uh, security proof. The point is that we want to show the extractability property for this commitment scheme. And uh, uh, prior to this work, it was only known how to do so uh, using ideal models for cryptographic groups, such as the algebraic group model, AGM, that I will briefly describe here. So uh, the AGM is the model where uh, we assume that each adversary is algebraic in the sense that uh, when adversary receives group inputs, and uh, uh, output some group elements, such as this C in bracket, uh, then uh, adversary should know a linear representation of the output uh, in terms of uh, um, linear combination of its input. So he should know this alpha, gamma, and beta integer such that the output T is obtained by this uh, linear representation. And this is, once again, formalized by the existence of an extractor that can, uh, we can think of this as a very powerful extractor that reverse engineer the code of the adversary and give back the coefficient of this linear representation. Uh, and maybe many of you have already noticed that using AGM it is actually almost trivial to prove the extractability of the kids AG commitment scheme. Uh, because say that we give uh, a commitment key to the adversary and then the adversary out the commitment, which is in the form of uh, some polynomial, uh, the group element of order f of sigma where f is some polynomial. Well, now we can invoke the AGM extractor, which recovers the linear representation obtained, uh, used to compute uh, this group element. But since the adversary has sigma to the various power uh, as only elements available in group one, then those coefficients are uh, trivially the coefficient of the committed polynomial. So we have recovered the polynomial. And note that this is a very powerful and useful extraction te technique because we can prove that the commitment scheme is uh, extractable only um, once we see a commitment. We don't need to see a valid opening. So we see a commitment, we extract the committed polynomial. And this is how the KDG extractability is proven uh, in uh, uh, Planck and Lunar, for instance. And they um, um, non-trivially rely on this very strong extractability property uh, to prove on top of that, the security of uh, many useful and interesting optimization that they use uh, for their SNARKs, such as batching commitment together, or uh, many of you may know the linearization trick, So what is the point? Uh, the point is that does not this not translate to um, a security proof of KDG in the standard model, and the, um, this is true because um, algorithm in the standard model can perform oblivious sampling, so they can sample group element without knowing they are discrete logarithm. Uh, particularly, let's say they sample a seed from a super polynomial mean entropy distribution. And then they use um, a wise choose and encoding function to encode this seed into uh, a group element X. Then if they choose this encode function wisely, to recover X, even given the seed, is as hard as solving the standard discrete logarithm assumption. For instance, we can use a class of function known as encoding from elliptic curves as this encoding function. Uh, which uh, translate to uh, one result from our previous paper uh, publishing uh, the last TCC, uh, which states that the extraction from the keys AG commitment only without seeing a valid open does not hold in the standard model. So hopefully this convinced you that uh, we need a new security proof for the extractability of the keys AG commitment scheme. And if so far, if you have no question, then I move on to the uh, second part of the talk and actually present our new KDG security proof. You can continue, no questions so far. Okay, cool. Hope oh, because it's clear and not because I've lost all of you. 
Okay, so um, the first things that I will present here is the assumption that we use uh, to prove the extractability of the key DG scheme. Uh, also, I should mention um, that this um, security proof will be in the standard mode. So we will not use uh, any ideal model to prove the extractability of key DG. Okay, let's say that we have an adversary that receives this input, which is uh, none other than a, a key DG commitment key. And this adversary has to output uh, uh, a set of integers and two group elements, uh, G and Psi. This adversary wins uh, the game uh, underlying the IRSTH assumption if uh, S is a set of integer of sides n plus one. Uh, G is not zero. Uh, then let's define this uh, uh, vanishing polynomial, which is the polynomial of degree uh, n that has as root all element in S. So the adversary wins the game if um, the order of G and the psi satisfies this uh, pairing product equations. And the IRSTH assumption um, states that uh, um, it is impossible for any efficient adversary to win these games with more than negligible probability. And why this is a reasonable assumption? Uh, this assumption is uh, a variant of an already known assumption from Gonzalez and Ruffles, is the uh, IRSTH. RSTH stands for rational strong T. Fielman. And um, this suggests the reason why we should believe on this assumption. It's because if an adversary is able to win, then it has computed this uh, phi of x, which is uh, a rational function. So it's g of x over uh, zs uh, of x evaluated in stigma. And as we have mentioned already a couple of times, uh, this should be art for uh, um, cryptographic groups. Uh, but I say it a variation because uh, in our assumption, we give a slightly more power to the adversary. So the A in A RSTH stands for adaptive, uh, which means that uh, the adversary can choose the set S. Uh, however, uh, whatever is choose this set S, uh, if the adversary is successful, this C will always be a rational function. So even with this additional freedom, uh, this adversary should not be able to, to win this game. And this is just an intuition on why um, this is a reasonable um, standard looking assumption. Um, I think many of you who are familiar with pairing based cryptography can see that uh, uh, the assumption is actually uh, quite nice. Uh, those of you who are not in the paper, we have some uh, um, security guarantees on why this is uh, like a good assumption and a reasonable assumption to use. And to show uh, the extractability, we rely on uh, um, an intermediate result, which is quite standard in the uh, uh, zero knowledge field in general, uh, which is uh, showing this uh, uh, special soundness property for the key DG commitment scheme. So let's define this property. Uh, say that we give an adversary the uh, key DG commitment key, and this adversary is required to output a commitment and n plus one accepting proof. So all of them should be accepted under uh, different uh, evaluation points alpha i. So this alpha i should be uh, n plus one different alpha i's. If this is the case, uh, then um, Special soundness means that there exists an extractor which takes as input um, this output of the adversary, so the commitment key, the commitment, and also um, all the n plus one uh, different valid proof, and eventually compute the committed polynomials, which is a witness for the um, PDG commitment. But what does it mean? Uh, exactly to be a witness for the key DG commitment. Uh, well, it means that the extracted polynomial 
has to be compatible with the commitment. So if we plug it back into this commitment algorithm, it should keep uh, C, so the commitment we have uh, used to extract it. Uh, it should be of degree up to N, and uh, it should be compatible with uh, all the evaluation we have seen. So F of alpha I should be equal to beta I. And our uh, most important result is this lemma uh, to say that under the A RSTH assumption, the key ZG commitment scheme is special sound. Uh, I will just give an intuition of why this is true. So we can define the Lagrange polynomials for a given set S as uh, the polynomials uh, here in the slides. So we have n plus one different polynomials. Then we have the well-known result of uh, Lagrange interpolation for uh, n plus one tuples of uh, evaluation point and evaluation. State that the polynomial f of x defined by this formula is the unique polynomial of degree uh, n up to n uh, that um, is uh, evaluated uh, at each it, at each of these points, uh, half i gives it i. And the special sandwich instructor uh, just exploit uh, this Lagrange interpolation. So given the uh, input, so a commitment and n plus one accepting transcript for this commitment. Uh, first, compute the Lagrange, uh, compute this polynomial using Lagrange interpolation. Uh, then check if this polynomial is actually committed in C. If yes, very well, we have found our weakness. Otherwise, uh, we show uh, in our reduction that we can use all this information to break the IRSTH assumption. So uh, since we can break IRSTH assumption when this uh, do not happen, uh, this should happen with overwhelming probability, which means that the key ZG is special sound. Okay, and uh, this was actually like the, the most important idea of this paper. Uh, from now on, is, uh, everything is more uh, standard and involved uh, proof technique that uh, are adapted from other places to our uh, case. So uh, now we go uh, from uh, proving the sortability of kids AG uh, from the special subject. And uh, first, define the exhortability gain for the KDG commitment scheme. So we have this adversary that output the commitment and some auxiliary information. Um, we use this to feed the deterministic prover. And then we let this prover um, interact with the black box extractor. The extractor first check uh, if the prover um, gives an accepting proof at the beginning and then start to interact uh, with this prover and eventually output uh, uh, a polynomial f, which will be a valid witness every time um, this first proof computed by the deterministic prover is accepted by the KZG verifier. So to show the black box extractability, I need first to define this extractor. And I show you this extractor in the next slide. Oh, but first, uh, we have a we have a, like a small technical issue. So this instructor is um, uh, allowed to be uh, a Turing machine that is a little bit more powerful than the standard Turing machine we deal with in cryptography, because it does not run in strict polynomial time. It runs in uh, uh, expected polynomial time. So there should be like a small uh, number of uh, run of this instructor that can take exponentially long time. This is uh, allowed by uh, the definition, uh, like uh, it's, it's a standard thing that is allowed by definition. So um, we showed that uh, special soundness implies stability, showing the extractor, then proving that the extractor works. Uh, the extractor is divided into three phases. Uh, first, check if the deterministic prover reliably uh, returns valid proof. 
If not, then by the game's constraints, we don't have to extract a witness and we return uh, a bot value. If yes, then the extractor assume that this prover actually is quite good in computing uh, accepting proof and start querying it to uh, random challenges uh, sampled without replacement until it gets other n accepting proof. Uh, and once it gets n plus one accepting proof, then it just invoked a special sound of extractor to compute the witness. Uh, note that this second stage here can take a, a, um, exponential time uh, because it could be the case that the extractor just try all the exponentially many challenges and maybe even fail to find the n plus one uh, accepting transcript. Uh, but we show in the proof that uh, even though it can take a long time, uh, this um, second phase runs in time expected for India. Uh, why um, the extracted f of x should be a valid witness? Um, first, we show that if the first proof is accepted, uh, then the extractor fails in find other uh, n-accepting uh, uh, proof with very small probability. And this follows a technique uh, developed by Hattema et al. in 2021. Uh, and then we show that we can actually invoke the special sound extractor. And uh, uh, this special sound extractor uh, does not fail uh, with more than negligible probability. Here we have a more technical issue. So um, technically, special soundness hold against strict polynomial time adversaries because the IRSTH assumption holds against uh, strict polynomial time adversary. But uh, in the reduction, uh, we actually have an adversary that runs in expected polynomial time because we have this second phase. And we find out that this is not uh, actually a real issue uh, because we also have uh, this result in the form of a lemma, which says that any falsifiable assumption that holds against a strict polynomial time adversary holds against expected polynomial time adversary as well, and vice versa. And this is like a simple lemma that follows from um, the definitions of the construction involved and the Markov inequality. And with that, um, we have showed that the KTG um, commitment scheme is extractable in the standard model under the IRSTH assumption. Uh, so if there's, there is still no question, uh, then I will move on to the third part of the talk, which is uh, where we present the cosine size NARC that we can get. Uh, yeah, there is no question. Okay. Um, so we follow the framework of uh, using uh, an information theoretic proof model and KDG commitment scheme. And as a proof model, we use uh, PIOP, so polynomial interactive oracle proofs, the same used in dark, for instance. Um, which are defined in the following way. So we have a, an indexer algorithm that compute uh, some uh, polynomial oracles. We can think of polynomials involved in this construction as uh, trusted oracles that when queried on points always return uh, an honest evaluation of the polynomials at the queried point. So then we have uh, IOP prover and verifier equipped with these uh, uh, indexed oracles, equipped with the public statement and also the prover as the witness. And uh, an IOP round is uh, composed by these two moves. So first the prover uh, sends polynomial oracle to the verifier. And then the verifier replies with some challenges. And those challenges are uh, queried uh, to um, all the oracles uh, that the prover, uh, the verifier uh, have available so far. So uh, the uh, f of i or a descent and the oracle in the uh, indexer. And we can assume that uh, since oracles are trusted, that the verifier will get correct evaluations of this uh, uh, queried point at the queried polynomials. 
So we do that for many rounds and eventually uh, the two parties sends their interaction and they have the complete transcript of the proof. Then the verifier just run uh, a verification algorithm, which will output a, a zero or one um, according to if it's, if it's convinced that the prover uh, knows the witness or not. And we required this classic uh, uh, knowledge handling property modeled by the existence of an extractor, which takes as input uh, uh, an accepting transcript and just output the witness. Um, we can take uh, an PIOP and compile them into a SNARK using the KDG commitment scheme. So the SRS generator just sample a, a KDG commitment key and then um, commit to all the indexed polynomial and publish the SRS. Then prover and verifier, uh, they have to simulate uh, somehow the um, uh, IOP interaction. So um, when the IOP prover would have sent a polynomial, instead, those two parties engage in a three round protocol where the prover start committed to uh, the polynomial that uh, he would have sent and give the commitment to the verifier. And then the verifier open this polynomial to a random evaluation point or ask for an opening at a random evaluation point and check if this opening is correct. Now, when the IOP verifier would have sent uh, challenges to the trusted oracle, uh, here we don't have trusted oracle. Uh, so um, the prover has to send um, evaluations. And to prove that the evaluation has been done correctly, it also sends uh, KZG uh, opening proofs. So this five rounds simulates uh, the um, one of the rounds of the IOP. We do that for all the rounds of the IOP. And in the end, the argument verifiers just check uh, that all the KDG openings have been accepted and then use the original IOP verification procedure uh, to output zero or one. And we should uh, prove, uh, as we did in the paper, that we, this construction is knowledge sound. The proof scheme is uh, similar to the one uh, used in uh, Dark compiler. So uh, first, since the key the G is extractable, um, after we have done this opening at an evaluation point, we can extract the committed polynomial and use it to simulate an IOP adversary that will play with an IOP verifier. Then we argue that uh, the openings provided by the prover are consistent uh, with the, um, uh, the polynomials that we have extracted using the PDG extractor. And lastly, we argue that uh, when this is the case, we can um, at the end obtain um, a transcript, an IOP transcript that we can fit into the IOP knowledge extractor in order to compute the witness. So let's give, let's uh, see this proof more in details. Okay, say that we start with this uh, uh, malicious uh, prover for the argument. We use it to define uh, an IOP prover and we let this IOP prover play with the IOP verifier. So first, the prover generate an SRS and in, um, run the argument prover. When the argument prover return a commitment, uh, the IOP prover uh, asks for this random evaluation and get it uh, the opening. Now, at this point, since KDG is extractable, we can invoke uh, the extractor and extract the committed polynomial FI. And finally, we use this FI uh, to output uh, the polynomial oracle for the IOP verifier. At this point, the verifier will reply with some challenges that we forgot we uh, forward to the um, argument prover. And the argument prover will get back uh, is uh, evaluations with uh, corresponding KDG proofs. But the IOP prover at this point can also compute evaluation by itself. So it does so. And then it checks if the evaluation computed by itself are compatible 
uh, with the evaluation provided by the prover. Uh, please note that if all the extractions succeeded and if all the evaluations are compatible, then in the end, we got that the IOP verifier will accept if and only if the corresponding uh, argument verifier on the same uh, messages would have accepted. And those two conditions, the extractor succeed and the evaluation are compatible, uh, happens except with negligible probability. Uh, this is a consequence of, uh, well, this uh, should fail only with negligible probability because PDG is knowledge sound. And this should fail only with negligible probability because uh, otherwise we can use this malicious prover to define a successful adversary against uh, the evaluation binding. Uh, this will be an expected polynomial time adversary, but this is not a problem because we can rely on our new lemma and show that even if the adversary is expected polynomial time, it should not succeed in breaking evaluation binding. So we have defined this um, IOP prover, which makes the IOP verifier accept uh, with almost the same probability as the I, uh, argument verifier accept, which means that we are uh, we can use the transcript we have obtained to extract the valid witness. And this witness will be a valid witness for X every time the argument verifier accept, except with negligible probability. Okay, so uh, we are now at the conclusion of my talks. I will just have another slide on this uh, open questions. So can we be satisfied by uh, our construction? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Yes, because it's uh, the first constant size NARCs uh, in the random oracle model for this uh, um, for this universal framework for constraint system. Uh, but um, this NARC is not as good as construction deployed by industries as Planck and Lunar, for instance. Um, and this is true because those construction uh, apply a bunch of optimization techniques uh, of the KDG commitment scheme, uh, such as homomorphic properties, the linearization tricks, and some budget openings. And also, uh, once we apply the Fiat Shamir security to our compiler, uh, we get something that is um, not as efficient as the state of our SNARKs and not as uh, tight, not with as tight security proof in terms of uh, concrete parameters. So, can we find a better solution to this? Uh, this is what we uh, keep working on. We have some upcoming results. So uh, hopefully you will see uh, some questions to this answer soon, some answer to this question soon. But I would say an important uh, open problem is to find uh, a tight reduction from the standard IRSTH uh, that holds against um, strict polynomial time uh, to uh, expected polynomial time adversary of special soundness and evaluation binding, because uh, this uh, should be uh, used uh, as to estimate concrete security parameter if one wants to rely on our uh, proof for their snarks. Okay. So this is the end of my talks. Thanks for your attention. Hopefully I've not lost all of you. Uh, those are the reference of the paper I mentioned. And uh, please feel free to check our reprint. Uh, and if you have any question, I will uh, uh, happily take them now. Uh, I had a question. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, so you said you had some argument for why this new assumption is secure, sort of briefly yes. what to do. Yes. So um, let me share the slide again. Um, when okay. 
no, sorry. Well, I can answer without slides. Uh, when I mentioned that uh, the KDG uh, commitment scheme is not extractable in the standard model by the commitment only, uh, this was a result of our previous paper. In the same paper, we have a, um, a new and more realistic uh, ideal model, the uh, algebraic group model with oblivious sampling, uh, which is a group model that also guarantees security against this kind of attacks when uh, uh, adversary can perform oblivious sampling. And the argument we have to believe in our new assumption is a security proof for the assumption in this uh, new and more realistic ideal model. So mm -hmm. does this mean that the security proof of KDG rely on uh, uh, ideal models as well? Uh, we argue that no, uh, because it, it's, a, it's a very different usage of ideal models uh, to prove them to use them to prove the security of the assumption and then add standard reduction from the assumption from the um, for the security proof uh, under the assumption. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, a security proof directly in the ideal model is uh, like a less realistic security proof. Mm -hmm. And just one other tiny question that um, equivalence between like strict PPT and expected PPT yes. or falsifiable assumptions, was that something that was known or is that like I realize it sounds relatively straightforward, but was it known ahead mm -hmm. of your work? It was, uh, to the best of our knowledge, not known before. Because hmm. that sounds very nice. Um, yeah, but the problem is that we lose tightness. So the lemma is just on the form of if any strict PPT assumption has a negligible probability of winning some game, then there exists a negligible function uh, that will bound uh, the probability of expected PPT to win uh, mm -hmm. the game and vice versa. So the, the problem mm -hmm. here is that we lose tightness. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also have a couple of questions. So yes. uh, you already said, unfortunately, that uh, you are working on whether batching linearizations and other optimization tricks uh, yes. are possible in your, in your new model. Uh, do you have... Um, I'm, I'm not looking for... Uh, precise numbers, but um, do you know how much the overheads would be not having these optimizations, if it's something very significant? It will be very significant, yes. Like if you check, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have the exact numbers now, but mm. like if, if you check Planck paper, for instance, uh, you can really see that uh, the, the optimization that they have there uh, really relies on uh, those tricks. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it for batching. So, yeah, I, but I don't have concrete numbers of uh, yeah, yeah. what would be exactly the overhead. Because yeah. of course it will also depend on the concrete IOP that you will use. Of course. Uh, so uh, I'm not very knowledgeable about uh, these new assumptions uh, ICTH and so yours, which is adaptive ICTH. I suppose yes. that uh, yours uh, actually implies ICTH is weaker since the adversary has a choice of uh, the set. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, you are aware of any papers who which already relies on this assumption? Uh, no, this is uh, an assumption that uh, we introduced. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, not, uh, well, sorry, not only I, uh, A, R, S, D, H, but also R, S, D, H. Can you repeat your question? Maybe I've not understood it. So, uh, if any, uh, are you aware of any paper which relies on R S D H assumption? No, no, it's a new assumption that we introduced. Uh, you introduced A R S D H. Yes, and yeah, the, R, the the standard R S D H was yeah. introduced by this paper uh, from two thousand nineteen of Gonzalez and Raffles. I have the reference in the last slide, and they already relied on this assumption. So it's a shorter pairing based argument under standard assumption. Thank you. I have a look at it. Uh, 
I also had a question. Yes. Um, so thank you. Um, I was wondering, do you think that it's possible to also pre uh, prove uh, weak simulation extractability? We or... haven't looked at that, but okay. uh, it's on the pipeline of things that we should look at. Right, yeah. Yeah, it seems plausible. Yes, it seems, pl seems plausible. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I don't see any questions written on the chat, uh, and no one else uh, is asking now. So I would like to thank you again, Roberto, for joining us today and for giving this talk. And okay, we're welcome. really looking forward to uh, your next iteration with all the optimizations uh, for positive or negative results. It would be very interesting. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining, and have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Roberto. Great.